Chapter 12. What I saw of the destruction of Weybridge and Shepperton. As the dawn grew brighter, we withdrew from the window from which we had watched the Martians and went very quietly downstairs. The artillerymen agreed with me that the house was no place to stay in. He proposed, he said, to make his way Londonward and thence rejoin his battery, number 12 of the horse artillery. My plan was to return at once to Leatherhead, and so greatly had the strength of the Martians impressed me that I had determined to take my wife to New Haven and go with her out of the country forthwith. For I already perceived clearly that the country about London must inevitably be the scene of a disastrous struggle before such creatures as these could be destroyed. Between us and Leatherhead, however, lay a third cylinder with its guarding giants. Had I been alone, I think I should have taken my chance and struck across country. But the artillery man dissuaded me. It's no kindness to the right sort of wife, he said, to make her a widow. And in the end, I agreed to go with him, under cover of the woods, northward, as far as Street Shobham before I parted with him. Thence I would make a big detour by Epsom to reach Leatherhead. We went down the lane by the body of the man in black, sodden now from the overnight hail, and broke into the woods at the foot of the hill. We pushed through these towards the railway without meeting a soul. The woods across the line were but the scarred and blackened ruins of woods. For the most part, the trees had fallen, but a certain proportion still stood, dismal gray stems with dark brown foliage instead of green. On our side, the fire had done no more than scorch the nearer trees. It had failed to secure its footing. In one place, the woodman had been at work on Saturday. Trees, felled and freshly trimmed, lay in a clearing, with heaps of sawdust by the sawing machine and its engine. Hard by was a temporary hut, deserted. There was not a breath of wind this morning, and everything was strangely still. Even the birds were hushed, and as we hurried along, I and their artillerymen talked in whispers, and looked now and again over our shoulders. Once or twice, we stopped to listen. By Byfleet Station, we emerged from the pine trees and found the country calm and peaceful under the morning sunlight. We were far beyond the range of the heat ray there, and had it not been for the silent desertion of some of the houses, the stirring movement of packing and others, and the knot of soldiers standing on the bridge over the railway and staring down the line towards walking, the day would have seemed very like any other Sunday. Several farm wagons and carts were moving creakily along the road to Addlestone, and suddenly through the gate of a field we saw, across a stretch of flat meadow, six 12-pounders standing neatly and equal distances pointing towards walking. The gunners stood by the guns waiting, and the ammunition wagons were at a business-like distance. The men stood almost as if under inspection. That's good, said I. They will get one fair shot at any rate. The artillerymen hesitated at the gate. I shall go on, he said. Farther on towards Weybridge, just over the bridge, there were a number of men in white fatigue jackets throwing up a long rampart and more guns behind. Bows and arrows against the lightning anyhow, said the artilleryman. They haven't seen that fire beam yet. My fleet was in a tumult. People packing and a score of hussars, some of them dismounted, some on horseback, were hunting them about. Three or four black government wagons with crosses in white circles and an old omnibus, among other vehicles, were being loaded in the village street. The soldiers were having the greatest difficulty in making them realize the gravity of their position. We saw one shriveled old fellow with a huge box and a score or more of flower pots containing orchids, angrily expostulating with the corporal who would leave them behind. I stopped and gripped his arm. Do you know what's over there? I said, pointing at the pine tops that hid the Martians. Ugh, he said, turning. I was explaining these is valuable. Death, I shouted. Death is coming. Death! And leaving him to digest that, if he could, I hurried on after their artillerymen. There was a lot of shouting, and one man was even jesting. The idea that people seemed to have here were that the Martians were simply formidable human beings who might attack and sack the town to be certainly destroyed in the end. Every now and then, people would glance nervously across the way at the meadows towards Chertsey, 
but everything over there was still. Across the Thames, except just where the boats landed, everything was quiet, in vivid contrast with the Surrey side. The people who landed there from the boats were tramping off down the lane. The big ferry boat had just made a journey. Three or four soldiers stood on the lawn of the inn, staring and jesting at the fugitives without offering to help. The inn was closed, and it was now within prohibited hours. What's that? cried a boatman, and shut up, you fool, said a man near me to a yelping dog. Then the sound came again, this time from the direction of Chertsey, a muffled thud, the sound of a gun. The fighting was beginning. Almost immediately, unseen batteries across the river to our right, unseen because of the trees, took up the chorus, firing heavily one after the other. A woman screamed. Everyone stood arrested by the sudden stir of battle, near us and yet invisible to us. Nothing was to be seen save flat meadows, cows feeding unconcernedly for the most part, and silvery pollard willows motionless in the warm sunlight. The soldiers will stop them, said the woman beside me doubtfully. A haziness rose over the treetops. Then suddenly, we saw a rush of smoke far away up the river, a puff of smoke that jerked up into the air and hung, and forthwith the ground heaved at the foot, and a heavy explosion shook the air, smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. Here they are, shouted a man in a blue jersey. Yonder! Did you see them? Yonder! Quickly. One after the other, one, two, three, and four of the armored Martians appeared far away over the little trees, across the flat meadows that stretched towards Chertsey and striding hurriedly towards the river. Little cowled figures they seemed at first, going with a rolling motion as fast as flying birds. Then, advancing obliquely towards us, came a fifth. Their armored bodies glittered in the sun as they swept swiftly forward upon the guns growing rapidly larger as they drew nearer. One on the extreme left, the remotest that is, flourished a huge case high in the air, and the ghostly, terrible heat ray I had already seen on Friday night smote towards Church and struck the town. At sight of these strange, swift, and terrible creatures, the crowd near the water's edge seemed to me to be, for a moment, horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but a silence, then a hoarse murmur and a movement of feet, a splashing from the water. A man, too frightened to drop the portmanteau he had carried on his shoulder, swung round and sent me staggering with a blow from the corner of his burden. A woman thrust at me with her hand and rushed past me. I turned with the rush of people, but I was not too terrified for thought. A terrible heat ray was in my mind. To get underwater! That was it! Get underwater! I shouted, unheeded. I faced about again and rushed towards the approaching Martian, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people putting back came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery, and the river was so low that I ran perhaps twenty feet scarcely waist deep. Then, as the Martian towered overhead, scarcely a couple of hundred yards away, I flung myself forward under the surface. The splashes of the people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were landing hastily on both sides of the river, but the Martian machine took no more notice of the moment of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot has kicked. When, half suffocated, I raised my head above the water. The Martian's hood pointed at the batteries that were still firing across the river and as it advanced, it swung loose what must have been the generator of the heat. Forthwith, the six guns, which, unknown to anyone on the right bank, had been hidden behind the outskirts of that village, fired simultaneously. The sudden near concussion, though last close upon the first, made my heart jump. The monster was already raising the case, generating the heat ray as the first shell burst six yards above the water. I gave a cry of astonishment. I saw and thought nothing of the other four Martian monsters. My attention was riveted upon the nearer incident. Simultaneously, two other shells burst in the air near the body as the hood twisted round in time to receive, but not in time to dodge the fourth shell. The shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, 
was whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal. Hit! I shouted with something between a scream and a cheer. I heard answering shouts from the people in the water about me. I could have leaped out of the water with that momentary exultation. The decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant, but it did not fall over. It recovered its balance by a miracle, no longer heeding its steps, and with the camera that fired the heat ray now rigidly upheld, it reeled swiftly upon Shepard. The living intelligence, the Martian within the hood, was slain and splashed into the four winds of the heaven, and the thing was now but a mere intricate device of metal whirring to destruction. It drove along in a straight line incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepparton Church, smashing it down as the impact of a battering ram went down. Swerved aside, blundered on, and collapsed with tremendous force into the river out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air, and a spout of water, steam, mud, and shattered metal shot far up into the sky. As the camera of the heat ray hit the water, the latter had immediately flashed into steam. In another moment, a huge wave, like a muddy tidal bore but almost scaldingly hot, came sweeping round the bend upstream. I saw people struggling shorewards and heard their screaming and shouting faintly above the seething roar of the Martin's collapse. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage, and through the tumultuously whirling wisps I could see, intermittently and vaguely, the gigantic limbs churning the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms, and save for the helpless purposelessness of these movements, it was as if some wounded thing were struggling for its life amid the waves. Enormous quantities of ruddy brown fluid were spurting up in noisy jets out of the machine. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing conflict of noises. The clangorous din of the Martians, the crash of falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds flashing into flame, and the crackling and roaring of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river, and as the heat ray went to and fro over Waybridge, its impact was marked by flashes of incandescent light that gave place at once to a smoky dance of lurid flame. The nearer houses still stood intact, awaiting their fate, shadowy, faint, and pallid in the steam, with the fire behind them going to and fro. Then suddenly the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping towards me. The houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames. The trees changed to fire with a roar. The ray flickered up and down the towing path, licking off the people who ran this way and that and came down to the water's edge not 50 yards from where I stood. It swept across the river to Shepperton, and the water in its track rose in a boiling wheel crested with steam. I turned shoreward. In another moment, the huge wave well nigh at the boiling point had rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scalded, half-blinded, agonized. I staggered through the leaping, hissing waters towards the shore. Had my foot stumbled, it would have been the end. I fell helplessly, in full sight of the Martians, upon the broad, bare, gravelly spit that runs down to mark the angle of the way in Thames. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of a foot of a Martian coming down within a score of yards above my head, driving straight into the loose gravel whirling it this way and that, and lifting again, of a long suspense. And then, of the four carrying the debris of their comrade between them, now clear and then presently faint through a veil of smoke, receding interminably, as it seemed to me, across a vast space of river and meadow. And then, very slowly, I realized that by a miracle, I had escaped. War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells Performed by Liam Knoll Arranged and introduced by Dalton Jones <laughs>